Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, on behalf of the Rocky Mountain Land Use Institute and the Scrivener Institute for Public Policy here at the University of Denver, um, welcome. My name is Susan Daggett, and I am the director of the Rocky Mountain Land Use Institute, and we are so delighted that you decided to join us to learn more about Proposition 123, which is going to be on your ballot here in Colorado this fall. Before we get started, I wanted to thank um, Nas Barma and Katie Aker of the Scrivener Institute and Lisa Larranger at Rocky Mountain Land Use Institute for helping to pull together this really important discussion. And thank you so much to all of our panelists and to all of you for contributing to our collective understanding about what Prop 123 is intended to do and how it could help address a significant issue that we face right now. And that is the cost of housing and the impacts of the housing affordability crisis on our state. A few um, uh, logistical questions or matters before we get started. There's um, closed captioning that's available for you. Um, you may turn it on in your Zoom settings. We are gonna use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask, to ask questions. Um, we will uh, have our speakers speak initially, and then we will reserve time at the end for, for moderated Q&A. We're going to try to get to as many of your questions as possible. I also want to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and will be made shortly, will be, be made available um, after the event on Corbell's YouTube channel. Thanks again for joining us. We have a really terrific panel of experts here to help us get this conversation started. I'm gonna introduce them and then turn it over to them and we'll, as I said, get to questions at the end. First, we will hear from Peter Lafari, who is the Executive Director of Maker Housing Partners, a socially conscious public housing authority based in Adams County. In addition to directing one of the most innovative housing programs in Colorado, Peter is recognized statewide and nationally as a leader on housing affordability and economic development. He recently served as a Terry Stevenson Fellow at the Common Sense Institute, and he is a frequent speaker on these topics. Next, we'll hear from Mike Johnston, who is the President and CEO of Gary Community Investments, which is dedicated to transforming the lives of low-income children in Colorado. Prior to joining Gary, he served two terms and with great distinction in the Colorado State Senate, focusing on major reforms related to education, immigration, racial discrimination, and economic development. This work grew out of his commitment to kids and his work as a teacher and a principal in high poverty schools. He is with us today because Gary Community Investments is a proponent of Proposition 123. Finally, Jen Lopez is the president of Project Moxie, a consulting firm specializing in affordable housing, homelessness, and community development in Colorado and New Mexico with a particular focus on smaller, more rural communities. Jen's previous work includes acting as the Director of Homelessness for Governor Hickenlooper, managing several supportive housing developments in three states, and working with the Colorado Health Foundation on their affordable housing investment strategies. She joins us from beautiful Durango, where she was previously the Executive Director of the Regional Housing Alliance. We are so pleased that these distinguished experts could join us today. And so without further ado, let's get started. Um, we're gonna hear first from Peter Lafari to introduce our topic and begin the discussion. Take it away, Peter. Thank you, Susan. And I just wanna thank everybody for joining us um, and my fellow panelists. It's, it's an honor to be uh, here with you today and, and to talk about such an important and transformational measure. And so, um, you know, it's no surprise uh, to many of us uh, that Colorado has rapidly become one of the most expensive states in the country to live, um, with an estimated unit shortfall really driving uh, the, 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 the cost dilemma uh, between uh, units between 93,000 all the way up to 216,000, depending on the study. And, and you know, what, what this really mentions is that, you know, we've, we've seen an, a, just an exasperation of the unaffordability crisis uh, throughout the pandemic, um, uh, pandemic buying behaviors, uh, um, uh, a rush into the uh, market for for uh, for for homes uh, and and continued strong net in migration into Colorado and so um, all of those pressures 
have just started to exasperate the existing acute challenge to be able to produce and, uh, and deliver uh, deeply affordable housing uh, for extremely low income Coloradans uh, who are, are really facing the brunt of this measure of, of, this, of, this, of this crisis. And so the National Low Income Housing Corporation has a, a fantastic uh, uh, report that they publish annually called The Gap and Out of Reach. And, and they've identified Colorado as being uh, the eighth most expensive housing market in the country, as well as having around 142,000 unit shortage for folks earning at or below 30% of area median income. And so Proposition 123 uh, takes this challenge head on uh, and has some bold and transformational elements within it to be able to provide the tools that affordable housing developers require to be able to create units from dream to grand opening. And so Susan, I, I think uh, if we can move to the next slide, that'd be great. Last year, a co-fellow, uh, Evelyn Lim and myself, we uh, we pulled some some data and started to ask us, you know, what's going on? Why why are we in this uh, acute crisis? And and really, what's happened is is we've we've really failed uh, to be able to deliver the amount of homes that are required for Coloradans to thrive. And so, as we can see here through the chart, and I, I, I don't want to get too much belaboring over it, but you know, we've been netting in a significant number of new Coloradans, uh, but we have failed to be able to introduce the units, uh, as Afford mentioned, to be able to meet said demand. And so uh, while we've been uh, gaining some ground over the last couple of years, um, headwinds are strong again. We have, you know, some may say we're in a recession. I think actually yesterday we, we tipped into it officially and there's a constraint in the market and that is impacting the ability to bring units to, to market. So again, Proposition 123 looks to introduce our first dedicated affordable housing fund so that we have consistent funding to be able to meet the needs of the subsidies to be able to go ahead and get these units delivered to market. And so Susan, I'll take the next slide. And so, you know, as we mentioned, uh, this is a dedicated and permanent affordable housing funding mechanism. Uh, about three times the Division of Housing's 2021 state allocation. Um, and there's some really interesting elements. When you look at the measure uh, in totality, it really starts to sing. It cooks with gas. Uh, it's, um, you know, the fast track approval process. Uh, many of us know that our local governments are struggling to be able to keep pace with the amounts of permits for, for new, build, new construction that are coming their way. And so that time is money. Uh, it's added uh, our report, a report that I published just recently with uh, the Common Sense Institute. Uh, we cite a study coming out of uh, Florida that uh, earmarks about almost uh, $6,500 in additional incremental costs driven by these extended approval uh, timelines. Also, um, we, there's, there's funding for land banking which is an interesting and, and innovative approach uh, the proponents have, have uh, articulated here. Well, traditionally, land banking is deployed in constrained or depressed housing markets, right, to be able to purchase blighted assets, usually through an urban renewal authority. Uh, the measure kind of looks at this and says, hey, let's, let's, let's empower local governments, let's empower nonprofits and, uh, and, and uh, for-profit developers, either through grants or loans, to be able to acquire uh, and retain land uh, so that they can uh, then go ahead and, and develop them and have it be in desirable locations. And so um, coupling that with community land trusts, and we really have a, a unique and powerful formula uh, for localities and developers to be able to attack cost and be able to bring units to market, serving those in greatest need, as we mentioned previously. Um, I'll also share that the tenant equity vehicle is something that just warms my heart. I, I think that it's unprecedented, uh, it's inspirational, and it should be celebrated. It would be the first of its kind at scale in the United States. Uh, so essentially, the tenant equity vehicle addresses the extreme gap in uh, wealth between renters and homeowners, which uh, as of 2021, the average net worth of a, a renter was about $8,000 compared to $300,000 for the average homeowner. And so uh, it's, it's no surprise that renters are facing extreme volatility in their housing stability, and it has compounding uh, impacts in all other elements of our Colorado society, uh, as well as our Colorado budgetary critical needs. And so, you know, by providing an opportunity where if the fund 
performs uh, uh, above a certain level, uh, the, the fund's administrators are permissed to be able to retain some of those earnings and then turn them into uh, either assistance for down payment for a home or what has been called other related services. And from conversations, we believe that there's a great opportunity for those other related services to materialize into uh, direct tra cash transfers, in, which could materialize as uh, an, an annual dividend, uh, which would be, again, unprecedented and quite unique uh, and uh, very inspiring. And so um, I'll also share, it's not on the slide, but I think that the growth targets that the measure presents uh, which, which, are, which also are a challenge, but when you look at the growth targets, because um, we accomplish what we measure, and you look at the fast track approval process, coupled with the, uh, the very evidence-based and, and sound uh, allocation of funds based off of the entire housing continuum's needs, right? This, this measure provides, if you have an itch, it'll scratch it, right? If you are focused on homelessness prevention, there's funding for you. If you're focused on um, uh, developing and you want to get uh, below market rates for subordinate debt, the measure has tremendous uh, earmarked funding for that as well. And so the measure really gets it right when it looks at who it's serving and how it can serve the entire housing continuum. So we need we leave no Colorado behind. Next slide, please. Uh, but here's the rub, right? And, and so we are a local control state. Uh, it serves us well in many forms of local governance. Um, and the measure honors that and asks local governments to opt in. And so uh, to opt in, it requires that three, it requires local governments to ascertain a baseline of existing affordable housing units within their territorial boundaries to include uh, rental units, uh, which would be identified at 60% of AMI and below, and ask that uh, that those uh, those Coloradans inhabiting those rental units do not pay more than 30% of their income on housing, so they're not burdened, and that includes utilities, and it's 100% uh, with the same construct on home ownership. And so, um, you know, local governments are going to be moving through that process, and they're going to be then identifying that 3% baseline increase. Uh, as well as their, the feasibility of being able to create a fast track approval process, which is 90 days, but the measure does provide relief both for developers and local governments that extend up to about six months, uh, pending, uh, depending on the needs of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, fully uh, completed development application. And so, um, you know, there was a question earlier, Susan, that was asking about equitable distribution. And, you know, and really what we're going to need is, is should the measure pass? And, and, and we're pretty bullish on that. I think there's, there's a lot of interest in this and, and Mike can talk to this very uh, eloquently in depth, but you know, we're asking local governments uh, to meet the moment and the audacity of the measure and the will of the Colorado voter and really push themselves uh, to be able to accomplish what is required to opt in and be able to tap into those transcendent elements that the measure provides. Um, next slide, please. So um, as with any policy, uh, as with any endeavor, there is going to be uh, 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 strengths and there'll be challenges and threats. And so while the measure does not trigger TABOR, right, this is a a transfer one-tenth of one percent of uh, federal taxable revenue within the, the, the general funds. Um, Tabor looms large, right? And so folks are, are going to be grappling with that. This will commensurately reduce future Tabor refunds, albeit um, uh, very small, uh, but ultimately um, Tabor is a cultural institution in Colorado and it will be weighing on the minds of voters. Also, as I mentioned previously, capture rates. Will local governments opt in? There is a natural trepidation uh, 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 of the human construct. Some folks might want to watch what other first movers are doing. Uh, and I will also say there will be on, the, on the, uh, the, the, the other side of the coin here, there will be a clear first mover advantage for local governments that opt in first, uh, grapple with the dynamics of the measure, and then uh, perhaps access a larger percentage of the, uh, take a bigger bite of that apple. Uh, but ultimately, the measure will succeed uh, if local governments engage, and we see a strong capture rate across our great state. And so if that would not happen, the measure does provide relief in the event that uh, the, the, the state's budget, uh, other critical needs 
the measure has a clause, a, a clause that allows the state to say, well, what's going on here if we have other critical budgetary needs and we need to, you know, maybe uh, take some of these funds to be able to address those. Um, but if for whatever reason uh, that local governments might find this uh, challenging in year one, let's say, of, of the three-year commitment period, there could be a risk for reappropriation. The measure goes uh, pretty far to try to buttress that, uh, but, you know, as we've seen during COVID, you know, challenging times create uh, uh, desperate measures, and so there has been reallocation in the past, uh, but again, the measure does try to address that and ensure that the will of the voters uh, and the funds are earmarked to what the voters have approved. And so, you know, then I think, again, it's all, you know, the $300 million question is, is that enough subsidy? Will $300 million uh, really help us? And is it commensurate to the people's investment? And so, you know, I think that when we look at how this, the, this fund's money is going to be very affordable, it's going to be what we call cheap money. Uh, the measure specifically states that it should beat the rates of the street. Um, you know, there's a great opportunity to braid these funds with existing one-time investments from the capital, from the General Assembly, which is about $1.2 billion over the last couple of years uh, to be able to significantly increase the number of affordable units that are being introduced to our Colorado market in a manner that we haven't seen previously. But that's going to be um, highly contingent upon local governments opting in uh, and the administrators um, being able to uh, facilitate that said administration of the funds in a timely, judicious, and consistent manner so that developers and local governments uh, can plan accordingly and the customer satisfaction uh, is reciprocal uh, because we want folks, the, the proponents want folks to come back to the, uh, the, I've been saying, you know, belly up to the bar and, uh, and, and consistently do that. And so, you know, this is really going to demand something from all of us, from the, from the legislature, from Colorado voters, from administrators and communities, right? And because you know we struggle with uh, approving housing in this in this state, really in this country, and so the measure is really challenging us to step up, provide the most fundamental need of Coloradans' lives, and do so in a way, as I mentioned with the tenant equity vehicle, to start to chip away at that very real, very traumatic equity gap that is plaguing so too far many of our Coloradan families. Thanks, Susan. So these are some of the targets, you know, the, the measure, the measure really works hard to provide a number of options for local governments. It, 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 it first starts off and says, hey, you know, uh, look at the ACS survey. So folks that really want to get deep into, into the measures uh, um, uh, bones, uh, you, you can take a look at the report that uh, Chris Brown and I published through the uh, Common Sense Institute. Uh, but that ACS data pulls baselines, as I mentioned earlier, uh, based off of that affordability construct. But uh, uh, in, in the event uh, that uh, those baselines might be out of reach, the measure provides what is kind of a fail safe. And that fail safe in uh, permisses the division of housing if the measure, I think it, it's the uh, the efficacious, uh, if, it, if, if the efficacious uh, implementation, I'll have to pull it up, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's a very beautiful language. Essentially, what it distills down to say is that if local governments feel that their baseline targets from the ACS uh, census survey data is not, um, is not, is not in, in line with what they believe is feasible, the division uh, is is permissed to find a, 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 an estimate uh, of their choosing. And so we think that that um, has pros and cons, right? And what I would say to that is, again, in our report, what we're saying is, is that go ahead and use that, right? We, if the will of the people is to pass this measure, uh, that we want to have local governments opt in. But again, we would like to see the division of housing, again, be judicious, consistent, and transparent uh, so that uh, all local governments are playing off the same sheet of music and there aren't any, you know, kind of winners and losers uh, um, uh, ch chosen, uh, um, albeit uh, without intention, let's say. So um, I think these are some targets, but there's going to be a lot of work should the measure pass around this time next year with identifying these baselines and then working to Together. And I'll just say at the end is, you know, I, it's, it's we, regionalism with housing is hard, um, right? right? Uh, there's very specific needs uh, for local communities, but what we would like to see uh, and what we would recommend is that local governments join together in regional consortiums and really start to hash out these fast track approval processes 
together so that we can have harmony so that our developers, our contractors have greater consistency from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And we can start to really start to attack. And this is another element I think that is transcendent in the measure, uh, our disaggregated project specific um, uh, land use planning and zoning environment here in Colorado. And so uh, uh, happy to answer any questions later, but I want to hand the mic back over to my esteemed uh, panelists. Mike, you're up next. Great. Um, well, thank you all so much. And Peter did such a fantastic job of describing a lot of the complexities. He, he sort of gave you the uh, version for advanced players already. So I, I will I will scale back and give you a quick overview of just the basic components of it. And I'll try to, I'll go pretty quickly through these because excited mostly to jump into uh, questions and conversation. I see there are some incredibly distinguished uh, leaders in housing on the call already. So um, both from Kathy Alderman at Colorado Coalition for the Homeless I see is on here as well as uh, Rick Garcia and uh, Bill Ryan, other folks who've done a ton of work in this space. And so we'll look forward to uh, hearing from them as well. They have as much to teach as to listen. Um, so um, I will give you a quick overview of Proposition 123 in terms of what it does and, and why we designed it that way. Again, Peter covered a lot of it. You can go into the next slide. Um, and I'll actually skip that when I go to the next one. I'll give you the shortened version. Um, here's the general overview, which is right now, the stunning thing is more than half of Coloradans right now can't afford to live in Colorado. Um, and what that means is they are spending more than 30% of their income to pay rent or to pay the mortgage. And that's the term we use for a housing burden. Um, and that is an alarming place to be. Now, that number jumps to 83% if you're talking about people who make $50,000 or less. So you talk about a first year teacher or a firefighter or a nurse or a service provider or a waitress. Um, those people, 83% of them can't afford to live in the state right now. And I think that's a little bit of the of the crisis that we are facing. And what we know is this is a crisis that is felt across the state. You may have seen the Colorado Health Foundation had a report that said that 86% of Coloradans now view this to be a major problem. And it's the first time we've ever seen polling that shows complete agreement around the focus of housing as the state's most significant problem from every geographic region of the state, every age, every gender, every party affiliation, every ethnic background, it just transcends all other divisions is the real focus on this as the crisis. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. This is the scare you moment. So I have um, two boys in the eighth grade and when they were going to their eighth grade graduation, I was thinking, oh, wouldn't it be fun if you know they'll graduate high school, maybe they'll graduate college and I hope they'll stay in Colorado, maybe they'll buy a home and live here. So then I just looked at if the trends we're seeing right now over the last five years continue for the next 10 years, what would my boys be facing if they wanted to live in Colorado? And here's the stunning data, which is if we keep going at this pace, 10 years from now, the median single family home in Colorado, the median home, would cost $1.7 million. And that would mean to buy that home, you would need to make about $375,000 a year in annual income to qualify for a mortgage. Um, and even if you say, okay, well, you know what? Maybe my kids will never own a home. At least they can live in Colorado and rent. Well, at this pace, just to be a renter in 10 years, you would have to make a median income of $106,000 a year. And you'd have, unless we're going to get to a $53 an hour minimum wage, this state is on the path to literally be a place that our kids could not afford to live. Um, and many of our parents would not be afford to stay, uh, not to mention the workers that are here now. And so you wouldn't, that's not a state that can afford to have nurses or to have teachers or to have firefighters or to have your parents live on fixed incomes. And so that is not a spot we want to end up. So go ahead to the next slide. So how do we hope to address this in the broadest possible uh, detail? And Peter gave you a very uh, powerful, detailed summary of this. At the largest scale, what does 123 do? Well, it tries to create permanent, dedicated revenue streams for affordable housing uh, to focus on the full spectrum of need, targeting folks who are coming out of homelessness to people who are trying to get workforce affordable rental housing, to people trying to get into home ownership. And it does that by creating $300 million a year in permanent annual funding that goes into affordable housing without increasing taxes. Very important to say that twice. $300 million a year without increasing taxes. And what it does in shorthand is it pulls those dollars from what would be tax refunds. And so Tabor said that if the voters wanted to, you know, if Colorado wants to use more tax money, they can do it. They have to go to the voters and ask specifically what that dollar should be used for. And that's exactly what we're doing. So we view this as honoring the legacy of Tabor, which is to say, 
to go to those voters. And since 86% of them are telling us they want us to do something about housing, we're giving them the choice to say, we would rather allocate $300 million to affordable housing uh, than to refunds. What would this mean? This would mean you get $300 million a year of affordable housing. It would mean there's no cuts to the general fund, no the current services are cut or diminished. And it would mean you'd still get a tax refund. So in a year like this, you'd still get a, according to the blue book, about a $710 tax refund as opposed to a $750 tax refund, but you would still get, you could still get 93% of your tax refund and you could fund a permanent uh, uh, supply of affordable housing. So that's, that's how it's funded. The second, which Peter described is in order to be eligible, to, eligible for these funds, we ask local governments to do two things. One is uh, they commit to setting a target to increase the stock of affordable housing in their community by 3% a year every year. So assume that you are um, a community like Denver and you have maybe 100,000 units in, in, the, um, in the community, but you have 10,000 units that are currently affordable units. You need to expand that number by 3% a year, which would be 300 units a year you would need to permit to be able to stay on pace for that. And a lot of smaller communities, it might be three units total you need to approve a year. But the idea is we're not just putting dollars into the system, we're actually guaranteeing we're getting outcomes of actual affordable units. And what would it mean these affordable units? Well, that what this would mean is that these units would be what, what we call permanently deed restricted to be affordable housing. That means anyone that lives in these units uh, never has to pay more than 30% of their income to rent. So take my example again of a first year teacher who's making $40,000 a year. 30% of 40,000 is $12,000. So $12,000 a rent a year is $1,000 of rent a month. So your rent in one of these units, if you were a teacher making 40,000, could never go above $1,000 a month. And the idea is, uh, and th these are eligible for people that would go all the way up to 120% of area median income. So that would mean uh, in many places that could be people on an income of up to 100,000 or $120,000 a year. So if you have a nurse and a teacher who are married and make $120,000 from the two of them, they are still eligible uh, for these um, affordable housing units. So that's, that's a little bit of the structure about what it means by affordable. And Peter mentioned the number of the gap in units. It's somewhere between 100 to 200,000. This $300 million number is designed specifically to construct 10,000 or to create 10,000 uh, affordable units per year, which puts us on the path over the next 10 to 15 years to actually close that gap that Peter described. So this is not a random number. That number is exactly the amount of dollars needed to leverage the 3% growth. And the 3% growth is what leverages the 10,000 homes a year you need to close the gap. Um, so that, that is a little bit how it's structured and what it does. If you can go to the next slide, that's where the dollars come from, what the priorities are. These are where the dollars go. And I'll just tell you, there are two broad buckets here. Uh, about 60% of the funds go to CHAFA, the Colorado Housing and Financing Authority. Those are the two boxes in red. And two of them are administered through the Division of Housing. Those are the two boxes in yellow. And so the Division of Housing oversees mostly what would be the grant-based programs. So uh, the homelessness programs, if that is a community who wants to uh, build transitional housing, to build permanent supportive housing, to provide wraparound services, um, to be able to uh, do all the things that folks like Kathy and the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless do, communities could apply for these dollars from Division of Housing. Similar with the home ownership structure, those are dollars that allow for either down payment assistance. So if, uh, again, it's, she was a teacher, I was in Eagle County yesterday with the president of the teachers union who's been teaching for 15 years and can't yet buy a home um, because what she can't get is the down payment to pay for a home. And so uh, what this would do is provide 40 or $50,000 of down payment assistance to get them into that home so they could stay permanently um, in that community. The other part is um, the way to do this is through what are called land trusts, which would be what things like Habitat for Humanity do, which is a nonprofit acquires a home and builds it. They own the land lease underneath, but a, a homeowner can buy that home, but the home is comes at a reduced price. So maybe it's $300,000 instead of a $500,000 price tag it would have on the open market. But with that reduced price that a nurse or firefighter can buy it with, they can stay in the home as long as they want and they own it but the price can only go up a certain percent a year. So maybe the price of your home can go up 3% a year. So you might hold that home for 10 years. And when you sell it, you can sell it for 350,000. It's gone up 50,000, you've made some upside, 
but it stayed affordable for the next person that buys it. So that home stays permanently affordable. So those are two different strategies that a community could choose between around home ownership. Um, and then the great bulk of the fund is focused on workforce housing, which is uh, what, what Peter described as this would be for rental units that would be permanently affordable. People don't pay more than 30% of their income to rent. And it includes what Peter described as what we called um, wealth building or tenant equity, which is the thing we're most excited about this is what's happening right now in the Colorado housing market is you have a bunch of out-of-state investors who are coming into Colorado. They're investing in housing, and then they want massive 20% returns on that investment. And so all the developers here can do is dramatically raise rents to pay back those investors what they're owed. What this does is reverses that cycle and takes the money out of the pockets of out-of-state investors and puts it back in the pockets of Coloradans. So what it does here is Chaffa would be the actual equity investor in these deals, but instead of wanting a 20% return, they would only take a 2 or a 3% return. And that difference alone and just what that money expects drops the cost of a rental unit about six to $800 a month per unit without additional subsidies. So you take a unit that was 1800, that's now $1,000 a month. And what you can do then as Peter was describing is that renter pays the $1,000 a month. And when they pay that $1,000 each month, $100 comes back into a savings account that they have. So they're building equity while they're renting because the challenge of renting is we don't want folks to get stuck as renters, but often a lot of us can't pay all of our bills and also set money aside to save money. That's what's the beauty of owning a home is you're saving money while you're paying. Um, and this is a way to do that as a renter. So that's the overview of where the dollars go, how the buckets are managed. I'm going to give it, uh, I'll just show you one last slide, which is you go to the next slide. These are some of our most recent additional endorsements, the Metro Mayor's Caucus that represents the mayors of about 50% of the state of Colorado. The Colorado Municipal League represents all the cities and towns across the state that have endorsed a lot of folks you'll see here from the Hospital Association, Bankers Association, Teachers Association, AFL-CIO, Colorado Forum, which is a statewide chamber. So that's the shortened list. If you go to the next slide, um, that is the full list that you will not be able to read, but we have now about 170 endorsers across the state. Uh, and at this stage, we have no declared opponents to the measure, which we're very proud of, um, uh, because I think everybody believes they have some stake in trying to find a solution, but we think this is gonna require a lot of effort to both still get it across the finish line in November. And then as Peter said, make sure it's implemented well afterwards. So I will stop there and give it over to Jen um, uh, to take it from here. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Peter. I'm going to be very short and sweet. I like to be the sweeper. I just focus on the high level points because it's so much fun to take the questions. And so um, I think I'm on the panel to talk about what it looks like for non-metro communities in rural Colorado. And uh, as a consultant serving and working with a number of partners in, in these geographies, I think we have an incredible opportunity with Prop 123. Right. We know the housing crisis touches every corner of the state. It just looks different. Right. So whether it's a rural resort area where the gaps are 300,000, 400,000 to close to the eastern plains where we need to actually just rehab existing stock. Right. So this these funds will be able to um, help communities forward any of those uh, specific strategies that they want to do. It, it can really be more of a community driven solution uh, pot of funds. And I'll talk a little bit more why I'm saying that. And we know the gap for affordable housing is like nothing we've ever seen before. And then you have a 7% interest rate today, like it's not getting any better. We absolutely have to have more than the two or three years of ARPA funding to, to, to go beyond crisis and start um, solving the problem in Colorado. And that's absolutely true in our rural non-metro communities. This funding is also important because it does go to higher incomes. And again, we know um, every community has slightly different needs around the income spectrum and this opens up opportunity to serve uh, workforce, um, and it provides more funding for our unhoused. So both uh, sides of the continuum will benefit, um, and we can be more creative. Um, so we got to play a little bit with ARPA and try new, we, we saw motel conversions, we saw you know different types of housing, modular, things like that, and we piloted, but now we could scale. So next slide. Um, I, I'm going to skip this one. I'm going to try to get to the questions quicker. Let's go next. So just some ideas. So in, in my part of the state, we have a pipeline of 700 units we're trying to create in the next three years. Uh, the average gap per unit, something like 93,000 per unit. That's a lot of money. When we modeled this, there was no way we could, could create those units with just uh, the existing funds in Colorado, even though it's half, you know, 500 million right now available. Available. So whether it's the Roaring Fork Valley doing uh, regional buy-down programs or Montrose working on permanent supportive housing, et cetera, uh, uh, these funds provide additional gap. Again, let us 
let us uh, address uh, housing needs that we sometimes can't address with federal dollars. That's one of the big punchlines here. If you're in rural Colorado uh, and you're not a resort area, you probably are 100% dependent on federal funds to meet your housing needs. This is a game changer. This creates a whole new uh, source of funds to meet your housing needs. And so I, I just think that this is an incredible opportunity for our communities. I think I just have one more slide. Oh, I do think it's important, and this question will come up by that Mike and Peter, but how are the funds gonna flow? Again, Chaffa DOH, two incredible state agencies. We have a lot of those leaders on this call today. Uh, they have the hardest jobs I think in Colorado right now, and so kudos to them. But they, they've already created a lot of infrastructure to get the ARPA funds out the door. So we're not starting from the uh, um, scratch. We're, we're building up from where uh, we've had to go in terms of capacity and being able to get funds out the door. So there's a really nice infrastructure already in place that we can build upon to utilize these funds. Um, they'll, be, they'll both have their own processes for soliciting feedback from communities. So again, the, if the funds pass, there'll be uh, community engagement. Um, there is a certification process. I guarantee you that all of us on this call and our state agencies will find ways to provide technical assistance to help you get certified if you want to be part of this program. And the most important thing maybe today, and we saw it in my community, um, we're dealing with a, a major homeless crisis, is we cannot avoid that. We can't, if we have an opportunity to not have a cliff effect with the ARPA funds, we have to, we have to jump. <laughs> we have to do this, right? So, and with the cliff effect, right, folks, is we have this huge um, influx of funding to help people now in a couple of years it's gone and that and we know the problem is not going to be gone. I think I might have one more slide. Nope. All right, let's do questions. Thank you so much to all of all of our wonderful panelists. Um, this is a really exciting moment in Colorado, I think, and really big ideas about how to solve this problem that we face. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in um, from our audience, as well as some questions that came in beforehand. Um, so I want to I want to turn to those questions now, and um, I have a question I, of my own that I that I want to ask, which is um, what we can know or what we can learn from um, other communities or states that might have tried something similar, and what their record of success might be. Is th is this a new a, a brand new um, um, idea for Colorado or, or are there some lessons learned from other parts of the country? I'm happy to jump in on that, Susan, and then I'm sure Jen and Peter will add. Uh, I'd say we thought of this as learning a lot from some of the mistakes that other states <laughs> made and some of the things that didn't work. Um, and so I'll tell you, you know, there are other states that have tried things like, you know, statewide mandates on zoning changes, like California just said, Every single family home in California is now a quadplex, you know, or, you know, you can say every home in, in the state can now build a mother-in-law unit in their backyard by right. Um, and I think the challenge is those do not seem to deliver the number of units you need at the price you need and the places you need them for the people you need them. Um, and so I think this is a different approach, uh, which is to give local communities flexibility to decide how and where to build but to give them the resources to do it and then to, to, to hold fast on the outcomes of what they want to meet to actually permit and provide a combination of carrots and sticks, carrots of dollars, uh, but sticks to say you really have to improve the speed at which you get these units approved and the quantity of them that you get approved so we know you're actually solving the problem and not just holding a bunch of meetings and not permitting anything. Anybody else want to jump in? I have a follow-up question too. Yeah, Susan, I, I, I'll share. I, you know, I think you know, the, the, the Colorado way, right, is, is to honor local control and, 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 and invest in, as Mike mentions, local governments who, you know, when we talk with, with uh, CML and we talk with the uh, mayors, uh, it's the number one topic on their mind. And they, they're, they're very gung-ho and very inspired to address the challenge. So, so the measure is saying, okay, we're going to meet you. Uh, in this in this Colorado construct, and and that's the three hundred million dollar question, right? And so I think as as we've been talking about, uh, other states are looking at you know surgical statewide or maybe not surgical. You know, California just released a suite of of statewide initiatives yesterday, uh, and a number over the last two years. And so you know it, we we pride ourselves on being innovative and pioneering, and this measure uh, harnesses that uh, pioneering spirit. And so as I mentioned previously, you know should measure pass. Um, we need to match 
uh, the will of the voters and and share that audacity and really you know work hard uh, to address the internally from all three elements as we mentioned right uh, to be able to meet the moment and to be able to permit the units as as Mike illuminated and then be able to move through the processes to be able to uh, accomplish this fast track approval process and I would say as well is you know uh, as a fan of the housing continuum but uh, existing to deliver big A affordable housing uh, but also uh, really believing in affordable home ownership uh, and being inspired by a number of the entities that Mike shared is, you know, can we even ask ourselves to perhaps fast track starter homes, which, you know, we just saw in the New York Times, uh, a very in-depth piece about the disappearance of said starter homes. And so, you know, I think that this could be the trigger uh, uh, that drives us into serious transformational change throughout the continuum by providing, as Jen mentioned, uh, that replenished amount of subsidy that is going to go so far. Thanks. One, I, I'm, a, I'm a land use gal. And so one of the things that I um, think about a lot is whether this funding is, is the only solution and what happens for those communities where, um, where money might only be part of the, you know, you might have the money, but you might not have the permit, the permitted authority to build what you want to build. And I wonder if you anybody would like to sort of speak to how the land use and regulatory regime in these places um, might or might not play nicely with this proposition. I'll quickly say, you know, water is a concern. Uh, uh, being a, an affordable developer in Adams County, uh, that is uh, front and center every day. And, and sometimes, right, you, you have no oversight or control of said uh, authority. And so I think that, you know, one of the recommendations we made, again, to drive regionalism and try to, again, create a new Colorado construct of, of housing regulatory uh, environment ecosystem is to say, let's tap into the significant investments the General Assembly has made the last two years, of which there are uh, uses for offsite improvements uh, uh, for uh, for paying for water taps, and so you know those investments have been made, and so perhaps uh, you know the general assembly would see it fit to empower the administrators uh, to be able to address some of those challenges that you mentioned, Susan, that are very real and omnipresent uh, by tapping into these uh, these other investments that we've made in previous sessions. Susan? Yes. Go ahead, Jen. Did you want to go? Go ahead, Jen. Oh, I'll be so fast. This has been my mantra for the last couple of weeks. Money is not the problem now. I mean, it, it, it will be a problem in two years, right? But uh, right now it's how do you cite projects and how do you get them ready to go? How do you create a pipeline? And so I'm curious how um, this Proposition 123s, um, uh, how it could be a, a real opportunity to educate uh, local governments that are maybe not as familiar with land use tools. I mean, this could be a game changer uh, in terms of being able to say, you have to do this, but here's some templates for how to do it really well. I, I hear a lot of um, concern, frustration about how to simplify things in rural communities. We just don't have the capacity, so. Yeah, I'd just say um, there are, we, we tried to, Susan, think about all the various obstacles that exist to that permitting and land use. And there's, of course, no one size fits all across Colorado, but there were a couple of, trends that we noticed that tried to address this in different ways. One is um, some places you have regional structures. I like I was talking to the town manager of Crested Butte yesterday. You have a small geographically constrained town like Crested Butte that wants to add housing but literally doesn't have geographic space. And so we enabled the, the opportunity for partnerships for Crested Butte to partner with the Gunnison County or unincorporated Gunnison County so they could do, they might do a Crested Butte housing project on Gunnison County land that they would both get joint credit towards their 3% targets for. So to create that kind of flexibility. We offer a, a number of grant dollars for land banking. So in places like Grand Junction, where Jody Cole will say, biggest challenge is you can't get land at all. If we had land, then we could actually zone it and we could build it. And so they have grant dollars they can acquire to acquire land then to put them in to development deals. Um, and then I think there are other places where there is a real need to build, but there, there are forces of kind of the NIMBY public resistance to building that is the counterweight. And we thought this was meant to be some wins at the back of creative and courageous county commissioners and city councilwomen who want to do that, who now can have people come and say, don't build it in my backyard, but they can say, okay, but 
I'm not willing to have our city or our county walk away from our share of $300 million of, of federal of state revenue to support affordable housing for the sake of your one opposition. Um, and I'm sorry, we can't do 17 more public hearings on this question because we have a 90 day fast track we have to meet. And so we'll have one very thoughtful public hearing to get your feedback, but then we got to make a decision. Um, and I didn't know Peter's great data about the, what I think Peter said, $8,000 cost per unit of that time cost of delay. These were meant to be the tools that all gave more tools in the toolbox for local leaders who are trying to get there uh, based on what their local pressure might be, whether it's can't get land, don't have enough space, can't get political will. Um, and even on things like density, we couldn't mandate density. But if you're going to meet your 3% target every year, year over year, you're going to have to think about where you're going to put those units that require more and more density because you can't just keep building out. And so we thought that was the, you know, a more of a kind of Colorado approach to getting to these values of environmental sustainability and density, which are listed as priorities in project approval, but giving local control on how to do it. Great, thank you. So one of the questions that came in from our audience, um, a, a, a pre-populated question, really goes to the administration of these funds and how, um, what, what are the safeguards in place to make sure that um, these funds will be equitably distributed that they don't simply go to the urban um, large projects that are so typical um, and that we're making sure that the monies are used to build housing where it is needed rather than where developers are most willing to build it. Uh, thank you, I can take a shot and happy other folks to jump in. There are um, principles or priorities that are enumerated for the allocation of the funds. And the first of those is geographic diversity, so that it does need to be spread across the state to all regions. Uh, the second is need, you know, places where there, we know there are significant need as a priority. And the others include things like environmental sustainability um, and density and not concentrating housing in already low income neighborhoods. So there is a, there is a, a priority around mixed income and mixed income developments. And in addition to that, there are dollars for, you know, so I think for there are some local communities who said we'd love to permit more units, love to do it faster. We just only have one person in the office who does that. And she also, by the way, runs the entire planning department and runs wastewater treatment and also, you know, runs the front desk. Um, so there are grant dollars to allow municipalities to add additional staffing, about $5 million a year, to add staffing they could use to support expediting the process. And so I think that that would help them do things like develop partnerships with developers, bring them in. Um, and we think also one of the reasons why it's been hard to bring these developments to rural communities is there is no long-term stable revenue stream that makes them think they can come to a small community and stay there. Now that you know these dollars are coming year over year over year, you could have a reason to believe that you could set up shop in, you know, a Lyman or a La Junta or a Montrose and know that there would be a steady stream of projects. We've seen that happen with the transportation funds now, and we think that could, the same thing would happen with, with housing. Similar question has a couple of people asked about um, housing for people uh, who have disabilities and are living on a very fixed income and whether the whether Prop 123 will ensure that there's money available for universal design and for housing specifically focused on individuals living with disabilities. I might start this one and let you guys fill in, but I just, this is a huge shout out to DOLA Division of Housing has had a real commitment to people with disabilities with their voucher preferences and design guidelines for a decade. And so I suspect they'll continue with that and please keep advocating. There's gonna be opportunities to, to talk to these agencies and, and pressure point. Right. Yeah, Susan, I, I, you know, to piggyback on, on your the first question there about equitable distribution, you know, uh, we do not have an equitable and inclusive uh, uh, kind of uh, public engagement dynamic, right? Um, homeowners are, are notified, business owners are notified, renters are not. And um, also, you know, as we know, um, uh, low-income uh, Americans, Coloradans, uh, are, are struggling. They're working multiple jobs, and God forbid, you know, they they have the audacity to uh, try to be happy and 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 experience uh, love with their with their friends and family, and, and read to their kids, and, and and have some respite. And so they don't make it to public hearings, and um, and that's very detrimental to our representative democracy. And so I think that, you know, one of the the uh, the, the upsides of this measure 
is that as Coloradans come out in mass and vote for this, uh, does that change the calculus and start to drive uh, renters and those that may have never found or imagined themselves going to uh, their city hall and saying, you know what, like we want this and and start to you know provide some parity uh, and start to demonstrate the demand uh, for this so that locally elected officials have uh, the confidence that they can move forward uh, in the in the face of what has traditionally been significant opposition. And I see a, a, there's a question in the chat about why wouldn't local governments governments opt in. And, and, you know, when you talk to locally elected officials and their membership organizations, there are real threats, recalls, litigation, um, personal threats against uh, uh, safety. Uh, and so, you know, uh, this is something that the measure doesn't necessarily directly say that it's doing. But uh, if you vote for this measure, if you care about this measure, then you need to not just stop at the ballot box. You need to walk yourself, ride your bike, electric vehicle, uh, <laughs> whatever it may be, to your city hall and let your voice be heard because at right now that's not happening and it's not be the, the fault of renters it's not the fault of people it's the fault of our system and so perhaps 123 can start to bend the curve of those inequities and provide the representation that is required for local governments to say yes we're going to do this even though uh, there's going to be sizable opposition because as we know uh, there are there's anti-growth sentiment in this state and until uh, you know, we, 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 we tackle that. Uh, folks are going to mobilize at the point of greatest influence, and that will be their local government. So perhaps 123 uh, provides a change of the guard in that, in that dynamic, and we can see some equitable outcomes. Great. So there's a question um, that just came in about staffing, and I know you talked about staffing of communities that are maybe receiving the money, but this question goes to staffing for those who are trying to get money out the door. Um, is, there, is there money in Prop 123 to support CHAPA or Division of Housing, the administrators of these funds? There, there are both. There are funds for both of those entities, both for Division of Housing and for CHAFA. It's 5% of the overall to uh, Division of Housing, about 2% to CHAFA. And so that when we talked to both of those entities, they were great partners in figuring out how to implement. We knew they would need staffing capacity. So this adds, um, uh, and, and DOH's place, you know, dozens of new staff to do that and um, a couple million dollars worth of staff in CHAFA situation as well. So yeah, that we, there is adequate new staffing allowed to the administrators of these funds as well as support for local governments that want to staff up as well. Great. And I'll jump there too, Susan. And this is, you know, this is as local governments, right? This is a tremendous opportunity for transformational change as to how we do business. And so, you know, if we look at this through a Six Sigma Kaizen lens, what's driving value in our regulatory framework and what's not. And so, you know, to be able to accomplish these fast tracks, and again, I'm going to stump for regionalism here, but if we can come together uh, and start to ask ourselves, what is exasperating our FTE shortage? What is driving the inability for planners and consultants to not have the ability to, to staff right up and step in and be able to function with efficiency from one jurisdiction to the next is the fact that we have to have greater harmony and greater consistency. And so a way to do that to Sarah's question is to ask ourselves to meet the audacity of the measure and see what it is that we can reform so that we give our staff an opportunity to be able to expedite the approval processes. And this is something that we've done for generations. Our grandparents and our great grandparents, they in embodied a zoning code that was significantly less onerous than those that, uh, that, that than what we have currently. Susan, I'm not sure if you were going to go there, but there was a, uh, Jake had this question about the stick component. What happens if the municipalities, can I jump in on that one? Yes, that one's please. really important. Um, Jake, I'm really glad you asked that because this is designed to both provide an incentive for communities to participate. And also we want as many communities in as possible. So it is not meant to be punitive. And so there are two things that are important about this 3% target. One is that it is actually rolling over a three-year average. So take the community, I gave you an example. They have a thousand affordable units. They got to permit 30 a year. That actually means you have three years to permit 90 units. Uh, and the reason why is a lot of these projects are bulky, where right, you might have a 70 unit project 
that takes you a year and a half to get through. Um, and that would be fine. So it would give you multiple years to do that if that's the way that the, that projects come together, like Steamboat we were talking to, they have a very big Brown Ranch project that will hit their entire target for five years in one project, but it might take several years. So that's the first one. The second is if they don't meet the target, so say they have to get 90 units and they get to 85, um, then they would uh, lose access to funding for the next year. So they could not apply for new projects in year four. Everything's been funded from year one, two, and three is totally secured. It's not clawed back. It doesn't go anywhere. They get all those funds. And then they could reapply the next year for another two-year cycle. So if you're making a good faith effort to try to hit these targets, you can still be eligible for funding five out of six years of every six-year cycle, even if you're falling short. And so it's not meant to be punitive. It's meant to be, I like to say, a lot of on-ramps and not that many off-ramps to the funding because we want as many local governments to participate as want to do it. Great. I think uh, we've probably got one more question, which is um, what happens in years if the state revenues do not exceed the Tabor cap? So what happens in those years when we might not have and excess of funds? Yes, I should have known that would come from Bill Ryan. Good question. Um, so um, two things, Bill and others, if you saw last week the, um, the uh, new Ledge Council projections, it shows there is every single year that is projected out, there is ample funding for this measure um, every year without any risk. The second is what you see structurally is there is a structural increase of about 400 to $500 million of Tabor refunds every single year and growing. Um, and so right now that those refunds are three and a half billion and they're going to keep growing structurally over time. And so the short answer is there is no projection in sight, according to Ledge Council, where that would ever happen. And as you get into farther into the out years, that gets even less and less likely because the growth of the state gets even bigger away from the Tabor cap. So we think there's a very good chance that answer is never. Um, but in the event, you know, we they even modeled a 17% recession. Even with the 17% recession next year, you still uh, don't drop below the refund number leave, needed to fund this. So even in recession scenarios, there it's there. If that does happen, then what you can do is the measure allows the legislature to turn off half of the revenue in a given single year if there is a recession below the taper cap. Um, and you know, I was the chair of the finance committee when we hit the 2010 recession. We had to make about a 15% cut. Normally what legislators do is you don't cut core public services like housing or healthcare or education. You normally look at targeted tax cuts or others that you repeal in those times. So we're not assuming the state takes a 50% across the board cut, but that is a possible solution that we offer the legislature if they have to. All right, I think you talked fast enough that I might have time for one more question, which is, a, I think a quick one, but what counts as affordable housing? Do they need to be deed restricted? Thank you. I was going to try to sneak that one in because I saw you. Uh, yes. So these are all the rental units will be permanently deed restricted affordable housing at, uh, that you're not paying more than 30% of your income to rent. Um, the home ownership ones, those could be, some of those can be deed restricted. Some of those can be down payment assistance, but the workforce rental units are all permanently deed restricted, which is a big deal because if you get a 15 year deed restriction, as you know, Susan, that seems great. And then you realize how fast 15 years go and all those are lost to the market again. So we think that was a really important component. All right, thank you. I think we are right at time. I wanna be really respectful of everybody's, um, of everybody's time. And, um, but I do wanna give a huge thank you to Peter, Mike and um, uh, Jen and uh, the Scrivener Institute and the Rocky Mountain Land Use Institute for helping to put together a really interesting uh, conversation and for your work in this important space. We are, we, are, we are poised, I think, to make a real difference in the state of Colorado in all kinds of ways and helping to address this crisis that we're in. And I, I thank you all for being part of the discussion. We will be hosting uh, this conversation, the, the recording on the Corbell YouTube channel. We'll be sending around the links. Please get this word out as far and wide as you can, feel free to, to, to pass the recordings on to anybody who might be interested. So thank you again for joining us and hope to see you again soon.